So good morning. morning. St. Davidians? (laughs) Yeah? Y'all are... Or Davidians? Or Whalians? Or whatever. My name's Linda Potter, and um, some of you I may have met in past times uh, when I served as Bishop Ladahoff's Canton the Ordinary, which was like from 99 to 2003. And um, then I moved took a call to a congregation in the Diocese of Chicago where I uh, retired in 2014 and came back home. Oregon was my sponsoring, uh, was my ordaining diocese, so this was home. My husband is a native Oregonian, so we feel like Oregon is our home. And I'm delighted to be with you. When I first came back after I retired, I um, slipped in here, kind of unknown, under the radar, just to kind of check things out because I was trying to decide where uh, our husband are trying to decide where um, we wanted our home church to be. And uh, so it's wonderful to be able to be back with you again. Um, I'm grateful to Dennis for inviting me to be with you and... um, Well, maybe you don't know this, but I bet you do, that Dennis is kind of mischievous. (laughs) Oh, see, you do know him. Awesome. And I have a sneaking hunch that he read ahead to today's gospel and said something like, no, 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 I'm not going to preach on that. Let someone else accept the challenge. And so in his mischievousness and his way, he thought of me. Now, the way we, the way I know Dennis is he was a co- he was a friend, a colleague of a, of my best friend from seminary. They're both from New Jersey, so that's how small world, isn't it? So he thought of me, and so here we are. Here we are. And I trust that the Holy Spirit, as preceded us, came with us, will walk out with us, and that she will move. She will move within this place, even if my words fall flat. She's going to be moving, okay? So has a preacher ever said anything that offended you? Not so far. I love it. Or at the very least, you've walked out of the service, as you're walking out, getting in the car, well, that was a lot of hot air. <laughs> no, I have. I've, I've been to services like that where I've thought of that. So I'm a guest in your space, so I'll do my best not to offend you. I don't want de- you to think less of Dennis for extending his invitation to me. Jesus On the other hand, Jesus, on the other hand, in our gospel lesson today, seems intent on offending people. Now, I don't think that was his intention. I think he was just being honest. I think he was being honest. And if if that word uh, uh, offending people is too strong, maybe at the very least, he's confusing them. He's confusing them. I also suspect, as we begin this service, that you will exhale a sigh of relief that we have finally come to the end of our bread sermons. Oh my gosh, who knew we could do this for five weeks? Five weeks. The last five weeks we've been reading in one chapter, the sixth chapter of John. And in this chapter, John accounts for how Jesus has tried all sorts of approaches to help the crowds and his followers come to an awareness and understanding of who he was and why God had sent him, what he was meant to do. Again and again, his stories and his miracles are meant to, if you will, sell to the disciples God's message. Since the weekend of July 28th, we have been hearing about bread. 
First, it was about the feeding of the 5,000 with those five barley loaves and two fish. Then it was the reference to the manna that God had sent to the wandering Israelites in the desert. Next, Jesus claims he's the bread of life, and that he's the living bread, and that those who would eat this bread would live forever. And today, today we hear Jesus claim that those who eat his flesh and drink his blood abide in him and he in them, abiding with one another. Jesus' claim has now become really, really personal, really personal. It's no longer about what happened in the past or the metaphorical description of what God has done. What Jesus now declares is that in order to abide, to dwell with him, the people listening must eat his flesh and drink his blood. So you can understand a little bit why those who gathered around him bristled at the thought, because you can imagine what they were thinking. But perhaps the challenge before the hearers was less about the physicality, the tactility of the statements, and more about whether or not they could actually believe that indeed Jesus, Jesus was God's emissary. Jesus was God's son. Could they believe that by ingesting the body and bread or the blood and the wine? That they would in some way, that they could in some way experience and see God in Jesus. John is my favorite gospel. He always, he's always way out there, grabbing people's minds and lives in ways that force one to stop and think. He, <clears throat> unlike Mark, you know, Mark just gives us the facts. But not John. I mean, he's like, he takes you over here, and then he takes you over here, and then he takes you over here. And then he takes you. His magnificent accounting of, of Jesus and God and the Spirit it's hard work, <laughs> friends, I think, in many ways. It's hard work to read John's gospel because we're challenged by his metaphors and his hyperbole and his irony, these layers and layers and layers and layers that bring us ultimately to the truth of God's message in Jesus. These provocative words, eat my flesh, drink my blood, for in doing so I will abide in you and you and me, force the listeners to have to make a choice. Do they believe or do they not? Will they eat and drink or will they not? Neutrality isn't an option for John's gospel. And so when the assembly hears these words, they're convicted by them and some take offense. These are indeed tough words for them to hear Jesus knew his message would be difficult for some. I don't think Jesus was surprised. Scripture tells us that he wasn't surprised by those who turned their face from him and went another direction. But I, I think Jesus was human. And I think he was deeply, deeply affected by having people who he thought were his followers and his friends, turn away. I don't know if you've ever had anybody abandon or turn away from you, but if you have, you know what that feels like. And I think that's the same feeling Jesus must have had when people turned away. The scripture tells us, quote, that Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not that did not believe and the one who was who would betray him so he knew it was going to happen he knew what was going to happen 
And so Jesus turns to the inner circle of the 12, those who have been with him all along, and he says to them, do you also wish to go away? It's the point of decision, isn't it? Because as they're, as those 12 are watching some move away, one has to, you know, one has to think, well, maybe they're having second thoughts too. Maybe they're having second thoughts too. Will you believe and follow me or will you not? I'm serving on um, the stewardship committee at my, the, chair, the parish where our membership is at St. Bede's in Forest Grove where I live. And um, over the years, I've, I've done a lot of stewardship stuff, but somebody told me a story one time about a stewardship committee. It was in a small congregation, and they, you know, the routine. They'd send out the letters, and they told the congregation in, the, in their bulletins what they needed, blah, 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 blah. So people had been contacted. But there were some, a significant number of people who had not responded. And so the committee got together and said, what should we do? And some people said, I think we should just let it go. And some people said, no, we need to know if these folks are on board or not. So they had this discussion, shall we say. Finally, after they talked about it for quite a while, they decided that it was important enough to know whether these folks were in or out. You can do with that what you want. But they decided it was time to say yes or no. It was for them a matter of conviction and commitment. And so they went forth. And they called the people. They wanted to know, are you in or are you out? Will you follow me or will you go away? Will you abide with me? Jesus says, or will you turn and go another direction? Do you also wish to go away? This is Jesus' question to which Simon Peter speaks up for the group. Don't you love Simon Peter? He gets to talk for everybody, <laughs> himself included. Lord, to whom shall we go? Where in the world are we going to go? You are the one who has the words of eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Wow. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. I wonder... I wonder if that's our declaration. Do we believe and know that Jesus is the Holy One of God? And if we do, how do we show it? As an outsider, may I share with you what I have discovered that I think you all believe, and how you know that Jesus is the Holy One of God. I did a bit of sleuthing on your website. Do you know, and you know this, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I want to reinforce it. Did you know that the primary words of proclamation are, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God? Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. God incarnate in Jesus Christ are in those words. The Holy One of God is found in your work. These are just some of the things I found out. Family promise, providing overnight hospitality. Remember the scripture, I was a stranger, you took me in. The hygiene for all. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. This is scripture. These are right from Jesus' words. 
that hot meal program in which you're involved, I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Your involvement in the Interfaith Alliance, the array of pastoral care opportunities, the open use of your space, your Christian formation, all respond specifically to the promises that you made and continue to make in your baptismal covenant. That's just some of the ways you all share and know and believe that Jesus is the Holy One. Being Christian and being faithful can be difficult. It can be a challenge. Do we wish to go away? Do we, you and I, find the struggle to be just too much and too heavy? Will we choose to turn back and follow no longer? Christians across the centuries have struggled with exactly these same questions. A few years ago, my husband and I, Tom, my husband Tom and I went we're on a, a pilgrimage, a Julian of Norwich pilgrimage in England. And one of our stops was in Salisbury Cathedral. Anybody been to Salisbury? Okay. Um, I wish we could just stop and just talk about Salisbury Cathedral, but we won't. Um, it's, a, it's a very holy place. The point of my telling you about Salisbury Cathedral is the ministry that the folks at Salisbury exercise because of their belief in God and in Jesus. Salisbury, the members live out their faith. There's 420 volunteers who help to provide a warm welcome to visitors in the cathedral. And they assist with the tours. We had a wonderful tour guide that took us all the way up to the roof and to the tower. Other people are there to tell about the chapter house and the Magna Carta, or they're just simply there to pray with you, to share in their hourly prayers. Over the decades, they've lived out their expression of who God, Jesus is, through their ministry of hospitality. Y'all do the same thing right here. Being Christian and sharing ministry, witnessing to God's good news, and Jesus is a way of life. And sometimes life can be difficult and challenging. And being Christian does not exempt us from hardship and sorrow. The answers to the questions we face do not always lead us where we think we should be going. Every day we are faced with indecision and questions. We wonder how to apply God's teaching to the specifics of our lives. And these questions become barriers and obstacles that block us from God. Or, or, as y'all have discovered, they can be opportunities for growth. My patron saint, Dame Julian of Norwich, said this of Jesus. He did not say, you will never have a rough passage. He did not say, you will never be overstrained. He did not say, you will never feel comfortable, uncomfortable. But what he did say is, you will never be overcome. You will never be overcome. In a few moments, as part of the Eucharistic prayer, going to hear these words. Therefore, we come to Christ in whom all is created in heaven and on earth, whose cross and resurrection make all things new. That's you and I, folks. All things new. We offer this to you, Jesus, asking you to smile upon the gifts we bring, for you alone are the giver and Christ the gift through which we live once and for all. Through the Holy One, listen to those words, through the Holy One who was emptied to bear your fullness, we make our prayer 
is all created life to the glory of God who fills all in all now and forever. That is our prayer to the Holy One. So as we come to the altar today, may these words of invitation open our hearts, open our heart minds, open our lives, that we too will say, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Amen. <laughs>